Paul and Fulperson, this is Anton, and looks like sometime in mid-November there is now 8 billion of us. Humanity has reached a new level. Somewhere on the planet, the 8th billion person was officially born. We don't really know who it is or where this happened, but this is what statistics tells us. And that's of course a result of an extremely fast exponential growth of just the last few hundreds of years. All of which happened as a result of major advancements in technology and more importantly in medicine. And so in this video I wanted to take you through a brief historical tour of basically us, humans, but more importantly discuss potential next part. What's going to happen next to humanity? Spoiler alert, we probably don't know, but there are maybe ways for us to determine where we had it. Now in terms of the actual calculations and counting the number of humans on Earth, this wasn't really even possible up until sometime mid-19th century, with the first billion assumed to have appeared around the year 1804. And so in just the last 200 years, the population increased by approximately 7 billion. But what about prior to this? And what were some of the major milestones during the history of humanity? And here the scientists have made some really good educated guesses based on what we understand about the humanity's advancements. Although I really wanted to show you this graph first. This is a typical example of an exponential growth, and in this case this is really the human numbers in the last 10,000 years. We'll come back to this in a few minutes. There's actually an interesting idea or hypothesis known as the Rudiman's hypothesis proposed by William Rudiman a couple of decades ago that makes an intriguing suggestion that right after the last glaciation period approximately 10,000 years ago, as early humans started to cut down some of the trees and expand their farming ability, it actually caused a small increase in carbon dioxide, which over time started to contribute to a relatively stable climate that lasted for 10,000 years. In other words, it sort of counteracted a possible another glaciation period and sort of stopped the glaciation and the ice ages from going on. Now we don't really know how accurate this is and it's actually kind of difficult to determine this, but it's still an intriguing proposition that suggests that humans might have actually started a relatively interesting period where Earth remained stable for 10,000 years. Something that some scientists also refer to as the Anthropocene engine, or essentially a kind of a cycle or a kind of a continuation where human needs, especially growing population needs, often created a kind of a feedback cycle that then influenced the planet. And though in some cases it influenced the climate as well, in many other cases it also influenced the fall of those civilizations afterwards. Very often resulting in climatic changes, for example due to over farming, with certain individual societies collapsing multiple times in the last 10,000 years. But also influencing everything around them and also influencing the planet at least a little bit. There's one common example that's often provided for this, the fall of the Mayan Empire, that actually happened even before the Europeans arrived to America, and in that case it was almost directly driven by various climatic changes, with many of them caused by the Empire itself. You can learn more about this in one of the videos here from Harvard, with the other example being the famous Easter Island. But despite these small setbacks, humanity as a whole was still growing and becoming more developed, over time growing in numbers all across the planet. With modern studies suggesting that ever since the Great Famine of 1315 and the Black Death of 1350, the population has been growing continuously, with the numbers back then being at 370 million, reaching 1 billion on the year 1804, but reaching 2 billion 123 years later, with every other billion decreasing in number of years. But these jumps in numbers are just one of many advances humanity has gone through that basically helped us become better, become stronger, and obviously become more numerous as well, with all this very likely starting way before modern history, during the period that we refer to as prehistory that unfortunately we know very little about. But we do have the earliest record of our genus, Homo, that was discovered back in 2013 and seems to date to approximately 2.8 million years ago. This specimen is known as LD350-1. With these first Homo specimens, sometimes referred to as Homo erectus or Homo ergaster, evolving approximately 2 million years ago and then possibly leaving Africa, dispersing across Europe and Asia. And sometime around this time, possibly about 1.5 million years ago, we have first evidence of our ancestors making fire. And this very likely was one of the first transformations that allowed early humans to start making more nutritious food and providing more nutrients to our bodies and especially our brains eventually allowed us to become slightly more intelligent. But all of these early humans were probably hunter-gatherers. And actually there's quite a lot of evidence to support this based on the oldest culture on the planet. 
And it's actually a culture that I'm going to be making a separate video about because it's actually absolutely fascinating how long a culture can survive on the planet, maintaining the same lifestyle and maintaining very similar cultural identity. I'm talking about a culture that not a lot of people know about. And actually there are only two cultures on the planet that have survived for thousands of years outliving everyone else on the planet. They actually survived past the glaciation and past a lot of other periods on the planet with certain stories that those cultures have telling us a little bit more about the ancient planet. But we'll talk more about this in some of the future videos. Anyway, we have the Aboriginal Australians that very likely arrived to Australia about 65,000 years ago, but we also have the Sun People from Africa, whose culture is believed to be at least 100,000 years old but possibly even much older, and it's a culture that maintained their traditional way of life, including hunter-gathering. And so just like the early hunter-gatherers, today the Sun People, as they're also known, will usually have quite a few children in order to maintain a dynamic nomadic lifestyle where they essentially move around as their prey migrates across Africa. Being the oldest hunter-gatherer culture on the planet, the anthropologists today learn quite a lot about the early humans by studying what they do as well. But naturally, some humans evolved to be agricultural. And it was that switch from hunter-gathering to agriculture that very likely suddenly propelled the numbers initially. Mostly because in this case, we no longer needed as much land to survive. For example, for a typical hunter-gatherer, a single person requires at least 10 square kilometers in order to successfully feed themselves over time. But for an agricultural community, the same area can actually feed hundreds of people, if not more. And so the introduction of early farms about 10,000 years ago many of which have been discovered in, for example, Europe, very likely resulted in the first population leap, allowing the humans to suddenly become more numerous. And the ability to store food, and to possibly even then trade food, allowed us to then evolve a lot of new things as well. For example, some of the early mathematics was very likely used specifically for farming and for trading. And that of course includes some of the early astronomy that was most likely just used for farming and for harvesting initially. Also, something that we take for granted today, baby formula and baby food, was also very likely initially produced during this period, allowing babies to grow stronger and reducing the amount of time between births, allowing early societies to have multiple kids successfully by providing them with just enough food. Interestingly enough, some studies have even suggested that different types of grains very likely resulted in different types of complexity, including cultural complexity, in these early societies. For example, by growing certain types of crops or certain types of grains, especially the ones that could be stored long periods of time, it allowed various societies to evolve more complex trading systems, including monetary systems, calculations, mathematics, and even evolve cultural classes where certain people were more important than other people. For example, with this study right here from a few months ago makes a pretty strong argument that the surplus of food was not enough to drive transition to more complex societies. Here they argue that various cereals like wheat, barley and rice, and not taro, yams or potatoes, resulted in more complex societies and civilizations. Because grains and cereals store and survive much easier compared to, for example, potatoes and yams. And so a lot of cultures where potatoes and yams were the primary food, because they tend to grow much faster and much easier but also are more perishable, would not provide as much opportunity for trade, for storage, and, by extension, for developing more complexity in terms of trade and storage, and even in determining how complex the society would become over time. Now, we'll talk more about this in some of the future videos, but it is a pretty intriguing proposition. And so a lot of these complex societies, especially the ones that were raising grain, eventually started to divide labor, which of course led to the development of various classes, the development of more complex cities, and naturally the development of various civilizations that became more and more complex. But all of this farming and domestication eventually led to some of the first problems that humanity experienced, when excessive domestication led to the transfer of bacteria and viruses from some of these animals into humans, eventually leading to some of the major plagues across history, with some of these early plagues resulting in pandemics, which spread across the planet, dramatically decreasing the number of people living on the planet. The biggest one was of course the Black Death of the 14th century, which decreased the numbers from about 430 million to 370 million. But this was naturally just one of many hurdles humanity had to overcome over time. And by 19th century, the advances in science and medicine eventually helped us understand how to deal with this problem as well. This is the famous Louis Pasteur with his experiment on bacteria in 1870. And so it was really that accumulation of all of the knowledge from the past, combined with all of the experiences humanity had in the last few thousands of years, 
that led to the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, with major advances happening all at once, starting of course with medicine and things like antibiotics and new types of drugs that we now learned could be used to treat various sicknesses, mixed with various advances in agriculture, including advances in chemistry that allowed us to produce more effective food, with all this eventually resulting in a dramatic jump in numbers, essentially exponential growth, in the last 200 years. And so we went from about 4 to 6 million people right after the end of a glaciation in 10,000 BC to maybe about 100 million in 2000 BC, 190 million at the year zero, 370 million right after Black Death, the last time population decreased dramatically, and 7.9 billion sometime in the middle of 2022. With November 15 of 2022 now officially known as the Day of 8 Billion. The day that we think statistically the 8th billion person is going to be born somewhere on the planet. In case you're curious, 7 billion happened in 2011, or basically 11 years ago. And so all of this was really a result of small improvements, small advances here and there. For example, eradication of smallpox, or various developments in heart disease that happened in the 70s and the 80s, which actually reduced the mortality in older people by a huge amount, and actually a lot of other small improvements in medicine and agriculture here and there, that slowly led to higher and higher numbers. But the thing is, this is not an exponential growth that's going to be continuing forever. There's a reason this is known as the population curve. It's actually an S-curve, also known as the logistic function or logistic graph. It sort of looks like this. And that means that at some point, we're going to be reaching a kind of a ceiling and probably even do a little bit of a drop-off. And that's because every year, the population growth has actually been decreasing quite dramatically. For example, here in South Korea, they expect the population to drop by about half in just the next couple of decades. Now, there are obviously different reasons for this, but here in South Korea, it's because, well, people just don't want to have kids anymore. Similar trends exist elsewhere as well. And so because of this, there are currently quite a lot of predictions suggesting that the population of the planet is actually not going to be growing that much faster and very likely is going to start dropping within the next few decades. Now, it could technically grow as high as 15 billion in the next few decades, assuming, of course, that we improve our economy, improve the living conditions, and encourage people to have kids. But today, a much more likely scenario is that by 2100, we're more likely going to go back to 7 billion people, with only a few people still having kids, and a lot of other people just doing their own thing. And that's even considering the fact that we expect people to live longer. So there's just going to be more old people, and a lot less young people. Modern day Japan is actually a really good example of that, and so it does to some extent show us what might happen in the next few decades. But generally, humanity just goes through these cycles all the time. It's a kind of a growth cycle. Things go up, things stagnate, then things fall. So maybe we're just in that downfall now, before discovering a new cycle that might start in the next few decades. For example, a discovery of new energy source, or any kind of a resource that's extremely valuable, just like in the past, might propel us to completely new levels and start a cycle once again, transitioning human society into a completely new era one more time. But for now we don't really know where all of this is headed. But here's the good news. None of this is really indicating that we're basically dying out or that we're headed towards some kind of a doom. As a matter of fact, similar cycles existed so many times before. We're basically just maybe transitioning into a new era. Kind of like back in the days, the societies transitioned from hunter-gatherers to agricultural societies and from agricultural to more complex cities with more complex class structures. We don't really know where all of this goes in the next 100 years, but I don't think seeing it in a bad light or trying to predict the end of our society is definitely not the right approach. No matter where this goes, I'm still going to be making videos about this and looking for more studies that help us discover what's going to happen to humanity, where we go, or what wonders we discover somewhere out there. And so until these future videos, thank you for watching, subscribe, check out all the relevant links, studies, and so on in the description below. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye. And if you are the 8th billion person, congratulations, happy birthday.